Now, the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome, everyone, to the Monday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Jim Garrity is off on vacation this week. Alexander DeSanctis of National Review is filling in for Jim today and tomorrow. Alexander, always good to have you back. Great to be with you. Well, we didn't want it to just be a mundane Monday in the middle of August for you. So we've got three crazy martinis uh, serve up to uh, our listeners today. Crazy, crazy, crazy across the board. And I think everyone knows where we're starting. And that's the news broken initially by ABC News that Jeffrey Epstein, a friend to a lot of powerful people, longtime financier, primarily with Democrats, but also had ties to Donald Trump at one time, the Clintons. Prince Andrew, you name it, uh, there's a lot of people, including some who got revealed late last week, which has added some speculation to this. He committed suicide, supposedly, uh, officially, in his cell early on Saturday morning. He was found unresponsive, some reports of cardiac arrest. Nonetheless, Jeffrey Epstein is dead, and the conspiracy theories are running wild. This is crazy on a number of fronts, Alexandra. First of all, from the actual official story that we do know, that even though Epstein had apparently been taken off suicide watch a few days prior to this. The night that this happened, the usual 30-minute shifts uh, going by his cell didn't happen, and those who were supposed to be doing it were on a ridiculous amount of overtime. The New York Post reporting that, surprise, surprise, the camera outside his cell isn't working. And within minutes, you had hashtags on Twitter of Trump body count, Clinton body count, and all sorts of other things here. And Basically, we're at the point that no matter what the official conclusion is here, almost no one will believe it. I know it's a really absurd story. And I think what's so odd about the whole thing is that I think it was, you know, no more than a a week, maybe a little over a week ago that Epstein was put on suicide watch, was thought to have, you know, tried to kill himself already. And then he was taken off, put back in his cell and his cellmate was moved elsewhere. And now we find out this morning that, you know, several hours went by before a guard checked his cell. It's all just a little bit odd. And I don't like to indulge in conspiracy theories and I won't be doing that. I think there's been a lot of unnecessary craziness when hopefully we'll get the facts. But I think it's very clear that Something very shady did happen, and it's odd. A lot of things are not adding up. The fact that the autopsy was just conducted and then we weren't told any further information, they're just kind of waiting on that. A lot of things are still you know, waiting to come out. I think we'll probably learn more that makes it even more uh, fishy before it all is said and done. And obviously, a lot of his high-powered clients are people with already shady reputations. I don't know if clients the right word, but uh, dealings, let's put it that way. Uh, so you've already got folks on the left saying, wow, this was clearly uh, Trump was in trouble and the Justice Department runs the federal prison system and all this stuff. And then, of course, uh, it was just last Friday that we had the court uh, release an unsealed document showing that uh, some prominent Democrats uh, from from previous uh, decades were allegedly uh, connected to Epstein in very disgusting ways. So uh, how do you expect the politics of this to play out? You know, I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that just because a lot of people benefit from the fact that he has died and the case against him can't go forward, that doesn't mean that the guy also didn't have reasons to want to kill himself. And I think that probably is the most likely explanation. I wouldn't be entirely shocked if something more, you know, conspiracy theory-esque did happen. I certainly wouldn't be surprised. But I think the most simple explanation is that he actually did want to die, perhaps because of the pressure of other people, you know, being involved, but also because he was in a terrible situation. I don't think it's crazy to think that's just what happened. All right. Well, let's move on to our second crazy martini here, Alexandra. And until the Jeffrey Epstein suicide, the big story of the past week, of course, was the series of mass shootings, namely El Paso and Dayton, and just a week before that in Gilroy, California. And one of the things that we heard repeatedly from uh, Democratic presidential candidates is that Trump's rhetoric directly led to this, particularly the one in El Paso. Uh, the the writings from the shooter there uh, that apparently have been uncovered suggest that he was uh, very much uh, upset with the invasion, as he put it. And that's, of course, a term that Trump has used. And so the Democrats uh, believe that Trump's rhetoric directly influenced this uh, shooter in El Paso, and therefore Trump is if not indirectly, uh, perhaps even directly to blame here. And so all week long, we heard from especially Beto O'Rourke, but other people like Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders and others, that Trump's a white supremacist, Trump's a white nationalist, Trump is a full-blown racist. And then, of course, we had to get to the next level, and that's that uh, anyone who supports Trump is basically complicit in the murders in El Paso and also are a racist if they support him in 2020. So a couple of clips on this. Uh, First of all, Jake Tapper asking the question directly to O'Rourke on Sunday. Do you think it's racist 
for, to vote for President Trump in 2020? I think it's really hard after everything that we've seen uh, from his time as a candidate in 2016 to his repeated warnings of invasions to his repeated calls to send them back. And that went on and on, uh, the whole litany of uh, what he disagrees with Trump on in terms of dealing with the, the travel ban, which he, of course, said was a ban on all Muslims coming into the country. Just last week on MSNBC, uh, Donnie Deutsch, who's a frequent panelist over there, uh, said that uh, the Miami Dolphins owner, who was hosting the fundraiser for Trump, can't wash his hands of Trump's comments. And essentially, if you support Trump, you own the racism. Stephen Ross, to me, is the epitome. The, the, this election comes down to guys like that and people saying, no, you don't get to say I'm for racial equality and all these good things. I disagree with him there, but I like his economic views. I'm going to vote for him. No, you own it. And I think that's the message that's got to get out that no, Stephen Ross, and no, a lot of my friends, you own it. You can't say, well, I like his economic policy and whatnot, and, but I disagree with you own it. You own the blood that happens. You own Charlottesville. You can't do it. You, can't, you get the whole package. And that's what swing voters have got to understand and be shamed into. You don't get to do that, Steve Frost. You don't go, I'll take from column E, column A, but I'm going to leave column B behind. You get column B also. You own the racism. Nothing like confronting rhetoric you think is reckless with rhetoric like that, huh, Alexandra? Oh, it's absolutely absurd. And I don't understand how we're now on, you know, what, year three, going into year four of this whole media circus. And people like Beto and people like these types of, you know, pundits, media commentators don't understand that they are asking, they're doing more for Trump and they're asking for more Trump, more than any Trump supporter ever could. They do more to help Trump than Trump himself ever could. I wrote about this last week when all these Democratic candidates started, you know, like you said, blaming Trump for the shooting, uh, calling him a white supremacist. These sorts of things help Trump because the average person looks at this. They probably don't like Trump very much. I don't like Trump very much. But I look at this kind of lunacy and I think to myself, he's better than this, right? Like as much as I dislike his rhetoric and I think he really should be a lot more responsible in what he says. The president shouldn't be saying the types of things he says or using that type of rhetoric when it comes to something that should be a policy discussion. But if you respond to it by calling the guy a white supremacist, you're going to get more of it and he's going to get off the hook for stuff he really should be held responsible for. And they, they clearly don't see that. I don't know why. Why do you think they keep pushing the envelope? It's one thing to say, you know, a harsh rhetoric, uh, you know, it, it's not helpful, things like that. We've certainly heard that before. Uh, we saw criticism of Obama uh, following San Bernardino and so forth, but uh, it didn't seem to rise to quite this level. So why do you think they want to turn the volume up to 11? Is it just because we're in a campaign season and everybody's trying to outleft each other? What's what's going on here? Yeah, maybe so. But I also feel like a huge part of it is, you know, kind of the social media echo chamber and the cable news echo chamber that we're in. People feel like they gain points and presidential candidates in particular, ones who are kind of drifting around the 3% mark like Beto, they feel like they gain points anytime they get attention. And so they're not too worried about a guy like Donnie George. I mean, who knows what he's doing? He's just talking to be paid attention to. But these candidates, I think they feel like the more outrageous they are, the more they vehemently condemn Trump, the more appealing they're going to look. And I think they're very wrong if they think that's how they're going to appeal to swing voters by shaming them and calling them racist. I mean, that's not... That's not a strategy for winning over people who probably don't even like Trump very much, but feels like, he, you know, he's the better option. What do you think the last week has meant for Beto? I'm sure he's obviously uh, reeling from what did happen in his community, but his rhetoric has uh, certainly gone far beyond what any of his rivals have done. I haven't seen it make a difference in any polls yet. And who knows if he has designs on getting into the Senate race against John Cornyn if things don't improve for him on the presidential front. But uh, what do you make of his performance in particular? I think he looks completely desperate. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see who this helps him with. He already kind of looked like one of the more radical and kind of, I won't say unhinged, but certainly willing to use irrational, easily disprovable rhetoric just to kind of get people to pay attention to him. I think he looks like a flailing candidate and he knows it. All right, Alexander, let's move to our crazy martini number three, and that is Joe Biden. He, of course, is still the front runner in the Democratic field, but he, like many of the other Democratic presidential hopefuls, were at the Iowa State Fair. They had to get their deep-fried Twinkie, uh, posed by the, the butter cow, which I assume is there again this year. I hope it certainly is. Uh, but Joe Biden was in a whole cluster of people, reporters crushing around him, uh, middle part of last week. And a, a student reporter affiliated with uh, Turning Point USA uh, came alongside and asked Biden 
and how many genders there are. There's audio of this, but there's so much chaos, it's, it's really hard to hear if you're not seeing it. Uh, and Biden says there's at least three. Uh, the young lady then says, can you name them? And he says, don't mess with me, kid, or something to that effect. And then he grabs her by the arm and says, oh, but don't forget that I was the first one in this field to endorse gay marriage, essentially. So, uh, Alexandra, what do you make of the at least three comment and how this issue is likely to play out as things get more intense in this presidential campaign? Oh, this is just too funny. I think this is the perfect microcosm of trying to watch Joe Biden become woke enough to compete with everybody else. And I think it's really dumb because my general analysis of what's going on in the Democratic primary right now is that Joe Biden is benefiting massively from the fact that he's the only viable person who even looks at all like a moderate. And so a lot of people who either, you know, might be moderate themselves, sort of independent, democratic leaning voters, or people who think that because he's more moderate, he has the best chance to beat Trump. That's why he's in the lead. And because, you know, sort of the more progressive far left vote is split among all these other alternative candidates. So the more that he tries to compete with them, I think the dumber he looks, he's never going to actually succeed at it. What is at least three? Is he going to have to come back and add two more when he gets accused of forgetting something? You know what I mean? Like he, he's just not good at it. I think he's um, not helping himself out at all. But it is indicative of kind of the pressure on him to um, catch up to the moment, not be old Joe from the 1970s. I think he might be in more trouble if he gets uh, accosted by someone from the left, because if you look at Facebook, for example, I don't know what they're up to now, but it was at least 57 at one point. So if he says <laughs> at least three, is he going to be seen as hopelessly unwoke by uh, the crowd on the far left? I don't know. I mean, my thesis, honestly, Greg, is that no one will ever be woke enough. Like, think think back to what... Uh, <laughs> Castro said when he was run, uh, I think it was during one of the debates or he recently said something about making sure that trans females can get abortions. Those are biological males. OK, so the guy's trying to reach out to the trans community and make sure he's talking about the trans right to abortion. But he accidentally referred to the type of transgender that's a biological male. So that person couldn't get an abortion no matter what gender identity they think they have. Right. You're just never going to be woke enough. Someone is always going to be mad at you. And given Joe Biden's age and how he approaches these issues, he's going to be the furthest behind the the curve here, right? Oh, every time. I mean, the only thing going for him is that he's been around, has experience, is associated with Obama. But if he's going to enter the woke Olympics, he is going to lose. (laughs) Well, can you win the nomination without winning the Olympics? That's the question. I I think so. If you're the, the most viable guy, you know, in that lane, I think you can. Well, we'll find out. Uh, so far, the the flubs haven't heard him, but he had a full week of them last week, and uh, we'll see what happens going forward here. Alexandra, always great to have you with us. Uh, thanks for uh, absorbing the three crazies, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more sanity tomorrow. <laughs> you got it, Greg. Alexandra DeSanctis of National Review, and for Jim Garrity today, I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and be sure to tune in again on Tuesday for the next Three Martini Lunch.